Betsy Olton. She is going to be doing the sexual, sexual harassment and discrimination training today. Um, she'll give you time to have questions if you have any questions during the training. I don't know if you're doing it before or after. No, well, it's pretty informal. Okay, yeah, yeah. so if you have any questions, just ask her and hopefully you learn something. <laughs> <laughs> I normally would use my own voice, but um, we need to record this, so I'm going to use the mic and hopefully not wander like I typically do, and now I can't see anything. Um, thank you for letting me uh, come here. We'll be about an hour today, um, covering a lot of different things, and mostly um, it's, it, it, it all surrounds workplace uh, behavior. Just a little bit about me. Um, uh, my company is HR Main Consulting. All of my clients, I've been in business for about seven years, are municipalities in Maine. So I work with a lot of the same sort of challenges that you all probably face as well. Um, so we will get started. Um, before we get into it though, um, this plays a lot into how we behave in the workplace. We are now working in an uh, environment with five different generations. So I thought this might be kind of a little bit of helpful information. Um, again, it's, you know, it's not exact science and it's not true about everybody, but it's, it's roughly um, the reality. So we have, we'll, we'll talk through our first uh, generation. And these are folks that were, are 10 years old to 25. Hopefully we don't have any 10, 11, or 12 year olds in the workplace, but uh, Generation Z, this is when they were born. <clears throat> this is what's important to them. They're multicultural, they expect to work with modern technology, they're independent, entrepreneurial, ability to multitask, they're less tolerant with authority, um, they do embrace change, value flexibility, they're competitive, and their average tenure in the workplace uh, in the same position we don't know yet because um, there's not en enough information in this age group. Um, so that's sort of your first generation that you're working with. And keep in mind when we're talking through these is people behave certain ways um, for a number of different reasons. Um, but some of them are generational and how do we sort of navigate through that in the workplace. So millennials, born, they, they're the ones that have probably gotten a pretty bad rap in the past. And, um, but really, they are ages 26 to 41. There may, may be some of you in the audience today. Um, typically idealistic, they're flexible, they're ambitious, they wanna keep on learning. Te your technology natives crave a work-life balance. Um, expect collaboration, it sort of require a seat at the table, making sure that their ideas are heard. Um, they're uh, you know, typically highly educated and their average tenure in the, work, in the same workplace um, is two years. Um, one of the challenges in municipalities in particular is the work-life balance, and maybe you've seen it, I know the PD and the fire aren't here right now, but it used to be that people really grabbed all that overtime to, to make their money. And we're seeing now sort of the younger generation coming in that they really want that work-life balance, and so they don't want the overtime. Uh, so what's happening is towns are, gonna, are having to fill more police positions and more fire positions because they're not uh, getting folks to take the overtime. So that's just an example of sort of the work-life balance piece um, for this generation. If you have a question, just holler it out. We do have, um, I I'll just repeat your question for recording purposes, but please just put your hand up. Um, so generation Xers are ages 42 to 57. Uh, they are typically self-sufficient, results-oriented, and hardworking. They are entrepreneurial, educated, and independent thinkers. They value diversity, challenges, and responsibility. They have high leadership potential, and they enjoy creative input and, resource, and they're resourceful. They embrace technology and social media, and their average tenure in the, work, in the same position is five years. <clears throat> then we have baby boomers. I'm one of those. Um, so loyal, self-motivated, high work ethic, live to work mentality, deep experience focused on financial stability and retirement, and the average tenure that a baby boomer stays in the same position as 15 years. One of the things I wanna comment about this is I wish, uh, as a baby boomer, um, 
I wish that I had more of that work-life balance um, many years ago. That's really probably one of the most important um, aspects of somebody's life is to, not to just have work take it over and have that balance of personal life and work life. Um, but this is sort of the MO of uh, your baby boomer. <clears throat> and then you have the silent generation. Does anyone know why it's called the silent generation? What? <laughs> so I didn't know either, but it's called the silent generation because they were brought up to be seen and not heard. Um, that's how they were raised. So they, um, and again, this is age six, 76 to 94. We have, we have this age group in the workplace. We have a lot of them in the municipality world. Um, so <clears throat> this is what is important to them. So or this is sort of their MO, traditional values. They're financially prudent. They believe in interpersonal respect. They're determined, resilient. They have a very strong work ethic. Um, they are, you know, don't really understand technology to the point that others do. Um, they are self-sacrificial and their average tenure is as long as their, their employer needs them. Um, I like to use this example. I don't know if anyone's ever been to a Sea Dogs game in Portland before, but um, there's a gentleman, Jimmy, who um, is 80, I think he's 84, and he's sort of the, you know, sort of the informal greeter there, and he's worked there for several years. And um, the Channel 6 did a, uh, a news clip on him, and they said, hey, you know, wh why are you, you know, why are you still working, you know? And he said, well, you know, they need, they named me here, and um, one of the stories was his, um, his wife became very ill uh, during the day, and uh, in the morning, and so he called the Sea Dogs to tell him he wasn't coming into work before he called 911. So this is sort of the epitome of this age group and sort of how they think. The reason I share this in, in all of these sort of respect, workplace behavior, um, seminars or webinars or whatever is because it, you can't bypass that. You have to understand each other's ways of thinking and how they, how they interact and how they operate. Any questions on those? Okay. So we'll get right into the professional expectations. So obviously if we're talking about respect in the workplace, it has to start from the top. Uh, there has to be um, that example. Uh, and the top for mu most municipalities are town or city managers, and then department heads, supervisors, et cetera. So if, if those folks in those positions um, aren't uh, respectful and are, are, are sort of, you know, not paying attention to what's important um, and how to treat people in the workplace, then there's no expectation that the rest of the employees are gonna, fo are, are gonna follow um, the policy. So here are some professional expectations, and the reason I like to share these two is <clears throat> I always like to give people the benefit of the doubt no matter what, and we sometimes assume that people that come on as an employee in a workplace know how to behave in the workplace, know how to, know how to be a, an employee, and they don't always know that. So once we you know, teach or train folks on you know, what's expected of an employee, um, then you know, you're better apt to be able to follow the policies that um, are required. So really, displaying a positive and respectful attitude. Work with honesty and integrity. Represent the town in a responsible manner. Perform your job to a reasonable, accept acceptable standard, hopefully higher, but you know, at the bare minimal, reasonable, ex reasonable and acceptable. Maintain good attendance. Conduct yourself in a professional manner even when off duty. Um, and following set policies and procedures when dealing with problems or issues. So if we, I think we have, um, so if we sort of follow this, the, these expectations, then we're not gonna necessarily run into the discrimination, the, the harassment, all of these things that we're gonna talk about today. Here are some examples of disrespectful behavior. These are just examples. Yelling or using profanity. I was in a meeting the other day. Um, granted, I really, I don't think that I am important at all, but my position is an HR consultant. So th this person was sitting with HR and um, 
another person and he used profanity throughout the whole meeting and didn't think, you know, it was very, it was disrespectful to me. It was disrespectful to the other person that was sitting in the meeting. And so I stopped and I said, you know, <clears throat> why are you speaking this way to me? And he didn't, he's like, what, what are you talking about? Like, this is how I talk. So, you know, so it was a, it was a opportunity to learn. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea. But it was an opportunity to say, this isn't, this isn't what is acceptable in the workplace. Um, and this is not how we treat other people. So even supervisors, you know, yelling at their employees, not acceptable. We shouldn't be humiliated and feel less than as a human in the workplace. So another example is constantly interrupting, spreading malicious um, rumors or gossip, name calling, making fun of someone, um, sarcasm to the extent where it's uh, hurtful, uh, rolling your eyes, offensive, offensive jokes, refusing to help someone, humiliating or belittling someone, ignoring someone and being impolite. So these are some examples of disrespectful behavior in the workplace that happens all the time. I see it happen all the time. I do a number of workplace investigations and I, I just see it all the time. And so, you know, what do we do about that? Well, the way to combat sort of this behavior is every single employee needs to take responsibility for themselves and their own and their actions. So let's talk through that a little bit. So steps to prevent disrespectful behavior. Before you act, consider the impact of, of your words and actions on others. You have no idea, or we have no idea, how somebody was brought up, what they're living with at home that could be very, um, you know, very dangerous, disruptive. Um, they could have a, a spouse that is dealing with something, and by making some sort of a comment that is is disrespectful can really hurt that person so just you know give yourself a, a thought before you make some sort of a joke or some sort of you know a comment about um, something that may or may not be acceptable create an inclusive work environment and that means we all have work buddies don't get me wrong we all have our favorites we all have people that we want to hang out with um, during work but during work we need to include everybody. Whether we like that person or not, they're part of the team, they're part of the organization, and so that's, that, that is a requirement and an expectation um, of being respectful and, and professional. Um, Self-monitor the respect that you display in all areas of your communication, including body language, uh, verbal, and whether or not you listen. Um, one of the most important things, I think, because a lot of people do display anger in the workplace, and you know we've seen it to a high level extent in the news a lot, but really understand what your triggers are or your hot buttons. If somebody's picking at you or um, you know really irritating you, we're all adults here. So you can go to that person and pull them aside and say, hey, you know what, what you said or what you did, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't cool, like please don't do that again. That's really how we should be handling um, any sort of conflict in the workplace is try to address it with the person um, that you have an issue with in a, in a respectful manner. Um, so I, again, know what makes you angry and frustrated. If you know what's going to make you angry and frustrated, then sometimes you just have to walk away or you have to just change the subject or move on. We're in a world right now where political discussions happen. Um, and that's a, sometimes a recipe for disaster. Um, you are allowed to talk about that in the workplace, but you have to talk about it in a respectful manner. And if you can't be respectful about it, then don't have that conversation in the workplace. Um, again, take responsibility for your own actions and practice self-restraint and anger management skills. You have an HR uh, department here. You have health that you, um, somebody that you can go to to provide you with some strategies on how to handle some of this. So, so utilize that, that's what, you know, that's part of the reason they're here as well. And really rely on facts rather than assume something. Nothing's worse than somebody saying, oh, you know, so-and-so um, got, you know, got special treatment and they're getting extra money and how come we're not? And then it spreads like wildfire and come to find out that's not even true. That happens a lot and people get really upset really quickly um, when in fact it's not even true. So again, these things that um, may seem sort of second nature to some of you, 
Um, maybe you've never heard that before. So um, these are just some of the tips that um, I wanted to sort of talk about before we hit the sort of legal um, <clears throat> parts of harassment, et cetera. So again, you do have an employee assistance program here. I believe you have Maine Municipal Employee Health Trust. Am I correct in that? Okay. Um, so the employee assistance program um, offers a lot for folks. Um, it's not just about sort of, you know, counseling and things like that. It also, it, it offers a lot of different um, resources such as, you know, budgets, things like that. So always you sort of take advantage of this. It's free, it's confidential, um, and it's for every employee, whether they have insurance through the town of Camden or not, and for everybody that lives in your, in your household. So let's start with discrimination. Um, keeping myself on task. Um, so what is discrimination? Because uh, it gets confusing when we talk about hostile work environment, discrimination. So all these words get thrown around. So I just wanted to kind of share exactly what it is. So discrimination is the unfair or prejudicial treatment of people and groups based on characteristics such as as race, gender, age, or sexual orientation. This is an example. So what I really wanted to go through, there are a bunch of laws that um, protect classes of, of folks. I'm not gonna read off what the law is. I'm just gonna kind of go through. What, what is a protected class? What does that mean? So let's quickly go through them just to kind of give you an idea. So age, <clears throat> the federal law, anybody over 40, um, is in a protected class. However, the state of Maine has an age discrimination law and it doesn't give an age. So there are some, you know, possibilities that, you know, and I'm gonna use the millennial group as an example where maybe millennials have heard, um, oh, they're just lazy, they don't, you know, they don't have any work ethic, um, you know, they don't work as hard as we do in this age group. So any sort of that type of conversation could be considered discrimination in the state of Maine. And it's just bad practice to, to make those comments anyway. <clears throat> disability, that covers both mental disability and physical disability. Equal pay compensation, so um, again, this is where sort of, if you've seen your job applications looking smaller and smaller and smaller. There are a lot of things that can't be asked on a job application. One of them is, okay, how much, um, how much did you make at your last place of employment? And how much do you wanna make? Sometimes there were lines for that in the, um, uh, in the application. And so what was happening, obviously a lot, was that employers were like, oh, so we were willing to pay $20 an hour, but this person said they only needed 17 bucks an hour? Great. So we're gonna hire them for $17 an hour. So let's just say that was a female. And then let's just say we hire a male who um, says I want, you know, I need to have $20 an hour, and they give him $20 an hour. So there's the disparity between you know, female and male, and you can go on and on and on about that, but that's sort of where that equal pay uh, compensation uh, law came into place. Genetic information, probably, I didn't know this until it, you know, a few years after the law came into effect in 2008, but that just means that um, uh, you're protected in a class if you have a genetic predisposition to some sort of a problem. So say, for example, your history um, says that you, uh, you have heart issues in your family history and your employer doesn't hire you because they don't want their health insurance rates to go high. That would be an example of what sort of genetic information is. Harassment we'll get to in a minute, national origin, um, where somebody's from, uh, pregnancy, uh, race and color, religion, sex, meaning um, interesting about the sex piece, it's ma you know, male and female um, or, um, you know, or other, um, but the law didn't think that it really covered the sort of sexual, the gender identity piece. So I think it was last year, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, they added sexual orientation and gender identity to the list of the protected classes because, um, because of that reason. Any questions on that? I, I think, I always find that to be a little bit somewhat helpful for people to understand. 
Okay. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about harassment. So, what's harassment? Harassment is unwelcome conduct that is based on race, color, religion, sex, including pregnancy, national origin, age 40 and older, disability, or genetic information. Harassment, so this is really important to understand. People say all the time, I'm working in a hostile work environment. A hostile work environment is a legal term. You may be working in a department where you feel like it's, there's hostility there. That is, um, that doesn't mean it's any less important. I just, it's just, there's a difference between what the legal term is for the, for the hostile work environment. So harassment becomes unlawful where the enduring, <clears throat> enduring the offensive conduct becomes a condition of continued employment or it's severe or pervasive enough to create a work environment that a reasonable person would consider intimidating, hostile, or abusive. The behavior must be unwanted and unwelcome. The behavior must be based on or motivated by a protected characteristic such as the victim's race or gender. The behavior must be abusive and the behavior must be severe enough that it creates a hostile or abusive environment by objective and reasonable standards. So I say all that to say, this is, <clears throat> if somebody complains of a hostile work environment, generally there is some sort of a workplace investigation performed and it may come back that it wasn't a hostile work environment, but however, there, it's an environment that um, is disrespectful, is, um, is in a bullying environment, and it's still um, not okay. It's just not illegal at this point in time. Um, the other piece that I wanted to say is, when you looked at those protected classes, there's hardly anybody not in a protected class, right? Um, it's really hard to find somebody not in a protected class. And if, they are in a, if they're not in a protected class, it still doesn't mean you can treat them disrespectfully. Just, um, it's, a, it's a difference of legality. So here are some examples of harassment. Racial slurs, insulting someone's religion, trying to convert someone's religion, jokes about someone's sexual orientation, asking invasive questions about someone's disability, sexual comments repeatedly and intentionally misgendering someone, mocking someone's accent, which I used to do all the time, in a good way. And I thought it was, because I was, I was mesmerized by this person's accent, and I pretend, I tried to emulate it, and then somebody said, aren't you an HR person, <laughs> and why are you doing that? So, um, so keep that to yourself, if you think that that's fun. Um, telling someone they're too old to do their job, uh, trying to convince someone to quit because they're pregnant, and saying certain genders can't do certain jobs. So he, these are some examples of harassment. Am I going too fast? Okay. All right. Um, so retaliation, um, that is just as illegal as uh, harassment or discrimination. Um, retaliation is where an employer um, does something adverse to you because either you've participated in an investigation of harassment or that you've reported harassment or discrimination. And so um, when you assert sort of, when employees assert their rights to be free from any of these types of situations, um, retaliation can occur um, and that is also illegal. We'll talk about that a little bit in this section. So what does a successful anti-harassment organization look like? So committed and engaged leadership. Clearly you have that because you're, you know, you're having me come here to talk about that. And also you have your policy, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So you do have this policy that um, I'm assuming everybody has read, understood, and signed off on. So it's sort of one of those things where, you know, if an investigation occurs, and I'll talk you through sort of what I do in an investigation, the first thing I'm gonna look at is whether there's a policy on discrimination or harassment, and I'm also gonna look to, to find a signed acknowledgement form from the employee that's been accused of it. <clears throat> so <clears throat> committed and engaged leadership, consistent and demonstrated accountability, a strong and comprehensive 
anti-harassment policy, which I read this, is excellent, by the way. Um, it's not a typical, you know, it's, it's, it's more informative, um, in my opinion, than some others that are out there. Um, and a trusted and accessible complaint process. So you don't have to, as part of the law, um, there can't be just one avenue to report a complaint. There has to be um, another avenue. So for example, if you're not comfortable speaking to your supervisor about this, you can speak to another member of management that you're comfortable with, you can speak to the town manager. So there's a whole, uh, it needs to be somebody that has, uh, that's in a supervisory role, but you don't have to report it directly to your supervisor if you're not comfortable. Um, <clears throat> and then regular interactive training tailored to our organization. So that's sort of what we're having today, although it's not very interactive yet, but that's okay. Um, okay. So what is sexual harassment? It is a form of sex discrimination that violates Title VII um, of the Civil Rights Act. So what is it? Unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual, sexual nature that affects an indi individual's employment, unreasonably interferes with their work performance, and or creates um, an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment. So if a coworker asks another coworker out for a date, is that sexual harassment? What? No, not officially, okay. Um, it actually is not. What, is, what will become sexual harassment is if that person says, no, thank you, I'm not interested, or no, or nope, um, and this other person continues to ask them out, that will create a sexual harassment situation. So you're right. So there's two forms of sexual harassment, quid pro quo, which is a Latin word, um, for this, for that, or something for something. Um, we'll get into that in a minute. And then, of course, the hostile work environment. Those are the two forms of sexual harassment. <clears throat> so quid pro quo means it's a tangible employment action against the victim when submission or rejection of such conduct is used as the basis for employment decisions affecting the individual. So, for example, I'm sorry, I'm using these uh, names, but that's what came to my head. Um, Sally will be given a promotion if she agrees to go out with her supervisor, Tom. So that's sort of a submission of conduct. You know, I, I know the only way I'm going to get ahead is if I go out with my supervisor. And then on the opposite end, John receives a smaller pay increase based on performance uh, than other employees with similar performance because he refused to go out with his supervisor, Mary. So believe it or not, this does still happen in the workplace. Um, and so any sort of... Um, person in power, which anybody in power is anybody who has the ability to direct you in your work. So it could be a foreman, it can be a supervisor, anybody that has that level. Just because they don't do somebody's performance reviews doesn't mean that they're not um, in a position of power over the employee. Now I know I have some um, supervisors and managers in here too. This presentation today is, is sort of for all employees. There are some special um, requirements that supervisors have to um, have to do and know. And one of those, uh, we're not going to go through them today, but one of those is if you see or you hear or somebody tells you, you have to report it. More importantly, you should intervene if you can. Um, if it's happening in front of you, to not accept it, absolutely don't participate in it. But these are anything that a supervisor does or do, does not do um, in terms of reporting some of these, that's a direct um, liability on the town. It doesn't matter if you have no other say other than you're supervising you know, a crew. If you don't follow um, your policy and report, when you hear th these types of things or um, you know, somebody comes to you and says, hey, I overheard so-and-so say to so-and-so, whatever, you gotta, you gotta address that. And either address it and ask Marlene how to address it or um, whatever sort of your, you know, sort of essential informal chain of command is. So a hostile work environment, again, we, we talked about sort of what it is. These are some examples. <clears throat> Telling sexually explicit jokes 
sending pictures of nude people, um, watching pornography in the workplace, um, where there's a chance someone will see, but recognize that you still can't do it even if you don't think somebody can see. So again, um, we're looking at the sort of legal aspect of it, but um, and we talked about repeatedly asking the victim out on dates even though they already said no, unwanted comments about physical features, um, different from the occasional compliment. It's okay to compliment somebody. Um, I probably would be careful on how I compliment somebody and maybe, you know, hey, you know, that's, you know, that's a nice outfit you know, or whatever, but I would be, I would, I would probably not do it because it can get you into trouble. Unwelcome touching and vulgar remarks about gender or sexual orientation. So these will get employees in a lot of trouble if this is happening in the workplace. Now with cell phones, with social media, with all the avenues that we have in technology, um, you know, remember number one, anything that you do on the computer in the town of Camden, that's the town of Camden's property, and they have the right to, um, to look at the history of what you've been looking at and all of that. So, um, and then even if you have your own personal cell phones and you're showing somebody something inappropriate or whatever, um, it, that's not allowed. That's just not allowed. <coughs> Any questions on that? Because it, people typically wonder, you know, you know, what, what does that all mean? Okay. Because when I, um, if I get a complaint and somebody says, um, you know, I, I sit next to somebody and I can see their screen um, on the computer and they, you know, they, Switch, tab over it or switch over it really quickly when a supervisor comes around the corner, but I see they're watching Netflix and, you know, they're not, appro they're not appropriate movies. Is it okay to watch a Netflix movie at work? I don't know. Maybe it is sometimes. Is that for me? Yes. Oh, thank you. You know what? I forgot I had this. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you, Marlene. I appreciate it. I'll take it. Mm -hmm. It is a little warm in here, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's one of those things where, you know, we have to just, we live in a world right now where some people who have been in sort of the town government for many, many, many years, it, 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 the way about sort of workplace life was your supervisor screamed and hollered at you and told you, you know, said, get off your lazy ass and get back to work. Um, you blah, 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 that happens happened all the time, um, and it was acceptable, but it's not acceptable now, so it's, and it is, you have to have a little grace for some people who have been in these positions for a long time to say, okay, <clears throat> let's work with and try to coach people who are, who have been used to leading that way in the past, and now you no longer can. So, um, I always like to give people the benefit of the doubt, um, I had a situation um, several years ago in a municipality where it was right after uh, President Obama was um, first, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Elected. Yes, first elected, thank you. <laughs> that went out of my head. Um, and so it was an, at an offsite department and um, one of the employees used the N-word in front of other guys. And so it was immediately reported so his supervisor brought him into my office and he sat down and I said, do you know why you're here? And he said, he thought for a minute and he said, is it that wood that I stole from the other side of the shed? And I said, nope. And he said, is it when I, I said, you know, <laughs> I, let me tell you why you're here. Um, and so I had a conversation with him and I was able to use my judgment in that situation where he wasn't immediately terminated because <clears throat> as he explained to me, he was from a different part of the country where that, unfortunately, that word was used um, when it should not have been used. And so I explained to him the seriousness of that. He, uh, we had mandatory training. He was very apologetic. He, uh, he, apologized and 
we moved on and he was one of the best employees there. So there are some circum certain circumstances where people should, we think people should know better, but unless they're taught and they're shown and they're trained, we, we've, we've got to work at sort of coaching and training. And I felt in my judgment, um, and by the way, he didn't steal. The reason why he was such a great, uh, he's, he's took wood from the little freebie barn they had at the dump, which was open to anybody who wanted it. So, um, so he did not steal, just so you know. Uh, the other thing I wanted to just uh, talk about uh, during sort of the internal com complaint procedure, and we kind of touched on it, I guess, um, is, again, if you have somebody that is harassing you, um, treating you in a way that you don't want to be treated, then you really need to tell that person to stop. Usually the person will stop. If the person doesn't stop, you, you obviously you want to take it to the next level. Um, but I always tell employees that if you're having an issue with somebody, make a note of it. Keep a note of it um, because you want to make sure that if there's an investigation or something happens that you, are, you can re recollect you know, what happened and when. Um, and, and keep a log, um, and there may be somebody that does it sort of, you know, is really good about, um, you know, treating somebody disrespectfully sort of under the radar, um, but other employees see it, you know, just, just make a note of that, because any of this type of behavior is, is just not acceptable. Um, and of course, report it. Uh, you have an internal complaint procedure in your policy here. I would encourage you to reread this again if you haven't read it in a while. I know this is a um, required class, if you will, or required, um, but I really feel strongly about people really taking this seriously and understanding how it affects other people around you when you think something's funny and it's not. Um, and then the we have to provide sort of an external a complaint process, and that would be through the Maine Human Rights Commission, and also through the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission um, with phone numbers for people if they feel that they need to call them, they have the right to do that. And again, we, we covered retaliation earlier, but it's really in this, in sexual harassment, it's taking adverse action against an employee who's complained of sexual harassment. And again, it's just as illegal as the act itself or the sexual harassment. So um, the other thing that, you know, those of us who, you know, if somebody reports a sexual harassment complaint to us and then they say, but I don't want you to do anything about it, we don't have that, we, we don't have that ability to do that. We have to, um, we have to look into that complaint. We can't just not do it. And the same thing I've had several times, I've had coworkers come to me and say, you know, so-and-so is getting you know, harassed, but she doesn't want anything done about it. And I have to just then say, I, we have to address it, and then I'll call the employee in and we'll talk about it. Um, <clears throat> another example, this wasn't that long ago, maybe eight years ago, another um, town where they had um, an off-site um, department. And they were all men in the department, um, but there was one female that would work part-time and go down to the, to the department two days a week. Apparently for months, she was very sort of a timid person, for months um, she was be there were issues going on there. It finally came to my attention. When I went down there, there was still a nude calendar in the break room. There, the men were using the bathroom with the door open, directly facing her desk. And so we had to put an end to that. So, you know, we think this will never happen, but again, I tried to give them the benefit of the doubt. When did we last have training? Did you ever have training? Do you know that this is not okay anymore? Um, never that it was to begin with, but it's really not okay. And so we had to sort of um, walk through that. And one of those person, one of those people, uh, was disciplined as a result. So the last piece to my presentation today is bullying. So bullying, believe it or not, um, it's not illegal to bully people, but. That's why, um, you know, Marlene and I have talked to is it's, 
it is important to have a policy on non-bullying. Um, and we'll get through sort of what that looks like. I just learned this this year. I had no idea there was a workplace bullying institute, but there is. Um, obviously, there was a need for it. So um, this is their definition of what workplace bullying is. And again, it obviously can lead to um, harassment or discrimination, but this is their, their description. Workplace bullying is repeated health-harming mistreatment by one or more employees of an employee Abusive conduct that takes the form of verbal abuse or behaviors perceived as threatening, intimidating, or humiliating, work sabotage, or in some combination of the above. So we started this presentation with professional expectations. Again, <clears throat> this is exactly what we talked about at the very beginning here. Um, it is, a, it, it, that's what it's called, it's bullying. So what are some of the bullying behaviors that happen in the workplace? Um, slandering, ridiculing, or maligning a person or their family, gossiping or spreading rumors about coworkers, taunting, teasing, or making jokes about a coworker. And I just want to kind of stop there for a minute because we all, like, I'm sure you're thinking, Betsy, like, we, we're, we can have no fun at work. <laughs> no fun at all. And that's not the case. You just have to be really careful because even if you're teasing somebody that you've been a sort of a long-term coworker with and they laugh about it, you don't really know how that affects them. And say it doesn't bother them, but you're teasing them about something and someone else hears it, that then it's going to affect them in a manner that isn't isn't okay. So um, just be again cognizant of some of these interactions that you have with your coworkers. Um, Persistent name calling that's hurtful, insulting, or humiliating. Um, abusive and offensive remarks, yelling, screaming, sarcasm, or other verbal abuse. And unreasonably creating conflict or refusing to work with a coworker. So, <clears throat> I, this happens more than you think. When two coworkers don't get along and they don't want to work together, but when you're in a small department and you only have three coworkers, <laughs> what do you do with the two coworkers that don't get along? Um, and so what really you can do is expect your employees to get along in a professional manner. You don't have to be best friends, you don't have to go to lunch together, you don't have to do anything, but you do have to be respectful to each other in the workplace. And then uh, a second sort of tier is physical bullying. Pushing or shoving or kicking, poking, touching, trip tripping, assault, um, <clears throat> intentionally damaging somebody's work area just to be funny or flip or whatever, um, hazing or initiations. That's a form of workplace bullying. And then the last piece of it is gesture, gesture nonverbal bullying, where, um, you know, sort of glances, body language, um, you know, there's certain, there's, <clears throat> there's plenty of gestures that can occur that people know what you mean by uh, when you gesture. Um, and then, you know, ignoring, ridiculing, or belittling a coworker's contribution, or, or in a supervisor's instance, maybe they don't like the person, and so they, they choose to sort of um, acknowledge everybody else except this one person, um, and <clears throat> deliberately isolating or excluding a coworker from work-related activities. What bullying is not, and this is important for everybody to know, is expressing differences of opinions offering constructive feedback, guidance, or advice about work-related behavior, especially supervisors particularly, or reasonable action taken by an employer or supervisor relating to the management direction of employees or place of employment. So um, managing somebody's performance. So <clears throat> employees, just because a supervisor says, we need, I need to talk to you about your performance, um, you're not meeting expectations, is that this is why, and the employee says, you're bullying me, that's not bullying. So we had to have some sort of um, language in here to indicate what bullying is not. Oh, are we done? No, oh, yes we are. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left um, of the hour, but I just, I know it was a lot of information. I know it seems like I'm preaching to people about behavior, but um, I like to have fun just as much as everybody else does, um, maybe more so than some. Um, I even have to be careful. I've been an HR uh, professional for, I don't even want to tell you how many years. Um, and I have made, you know, mistakes along the way. And I've said things because 
um, somewhat because of my generation. We used to be able to say certain things and then we weren't allowed to say certain things and then you gotta retrain yourself not to say it. I mean, we all have to um, really sort of self-reflect and sort of self-regulate and make sure that we are, um, you know, providing the best atmosphere for all of you. Like everybody wants to work in a positive work environment. They don't wanna come in and be yelled at or get, you know, get complaints or have somebody be a Debbie Downer or negative all the time. We want to be able to work in an environment where we feel valued and respected. And so that's only going to happen if everybody um, takes on that responsibility. So any sort of last questions for me or comments or I hated everything you said today, Betsy? No? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> you're welcome. Okay, um, great. I, Marlene, I think. So there's no questions or any concerns or anything? I've got one. I'll be, I'll ask. Yeah. If there's a scenario uh, where you're having a, a meeting with an employee, is it okay to record them or it, the meeting? So I. So this was actually brought up to a lawyer. The question is, um, if you're in a meeting with an employee, can you record them? Um, so in the state of Maine, it's, it's the law says, you know, overall the state of Maine says that only one person needs to be aware of making a recording um, in, in the room, but um, most attorneys have advised not to do that in the workplace. I, I don't know that you can't, but it's not advisable to do that. Any other questions? Scenarios? <laughs> and again, like you don't have to like not talk the rest of the day because you you know you're gonna think that you're gonna say something wrong. It's just about really we are human and we all make mistakes and we all do things that we probably would regret that we spit out of our mouths. But um, the goal is to you know continue to improve. So. Yeah. Well, what if somebody does do something wrong, okay? And then, like you said, it's different generations, they were acceptable at one point in time or another, and they haven't really learned that those things at this point are wrong, and they say it, and, they, and then they recognize that they've said it. How do they come back from that? So I think what I heard you say was, um, you know, if somebody's been working there for a long time, sort of maybe in a different generation where they know it's not okay to say or do what they did. I'm but just using that example because I'm in that other generation, but it could be anybody. Okay. So, yeah, you know, they just, they said something, they, they didn't realize it was harassment or yep. offensive or whatever. So how do they come back from that? Meaning? How do they come back from that without fear of being, you know, losing their job or, you know, I mean, because I think that's a big problem. They, they end up going down a slippery slope once they realize they've done something wrong and then the department, some people will be like, did you hear what he said? He did this and then it escalates and it becomes something that's harder and harder to correct that person when they really didn't intentionally try to do anything wrong. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So how do we sort of, because, you know, <clears throat> we do say that we, you know, we keep things confidential in, in some of these investigations, we can't always keep things confidential because we have to interview witnesses, maybe, or we have to interview somebody else. So um, I, I, I think as far as people being fearful of losing their jobs, um, I would hope, and I didn't look at your whole personal element manual, but knowing um, Marlene, I, I'm sure that there is a process by which, um, you know, before it would ever come to termination. And really, it's about, it's, it should be about education first. Now, if it's, a, if it's an offhanded comment, um, you know, those are gonna happen. So it's, it's just, you know, sort of a reminder not to say it, but um, if it's some... So let's step back, let's say they say it. Yep. What do they do at that point? They said it, they said something they, they know is offensive. Yep. They don't mean to say it. They're not really meaning anything by it. What should someone do in that situation? So just an employee happens to do it? They're in a break room and they're talking about something. Yep. And they say something, a racial slur or, or, or something about someone's age yep. or something like that. How do, they, how do they correct that? 
So the first order of business is if they recognize it on the spot, they need, immediately need to apologize. You know, apologize to the people in the room. Look, hey, I shouldn't have said that. I'm like, I'm really sorry, you know. And if they apologize, then that should be the end of it. Um, if it's a continuation of a problem, you know, and, and it, it happens and, you know, um, they do it and they say they're sorry six other times, then that would be a problem. But as far as like just trying to catch yourself and saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just said that. Again, I've done that. And I've had to, I've had to go back to people and apologize when I've said something. Um, you know, it's one of those things where, um, you, again, you sort of want to use the golden rule in, in terms of you want to be treated, you know, you want people to treat you the way that you want to be treated. It's the same with anything. If, if somebody is making, the, making any kind of a comment um, and they recognize it wasn't okay, they should apologize and, and they should just say, I'm really sorry, or pull that person aside if, if it was directed at, you know, apologize to the group and then pull the other person aside to say, look, hey, it won't happen, you know, I hope, <laughs> hope it won't happen again, I'm really trying to learn. So that would be the way. Um, I would hope that their supervisor, if they hear about it, um, we want to encourage our folks to sort of work out, you know, some of these issues amongst themselves without having to go to the next level. Um, because like I said earlier, you know, we are all adults, we're not children. Um, we should be able to have a conversation with another coworker and tell them how we feel and what and how they treat us, makes us feel. So um, I think that's a great question, but I, I did I, is that sort yeah, of like, does something like this, they really need to first course of action if the supervisor's not involved is the best thing that would be to apologize for at that point in time and say, you know, I, I didn't mean to do that. Right. I, it was a mistake. I understand what I said. And I think that's important for people to know because sometimes they don't know what that next step is. It gets awkward. Sure. And then the people move apart and then it just escalates. No, you're absolutely right. And that's where um, supervisor training, you know, <clears throat> I also do supervisor training for just such as that. So supervisors understand, like, you don't have to jump down, you know, somebody's throat immediately. If you hear something, here's how to, you know, handle some of these things. Because, again, a lot of people in municipalities get promoted to supervisors and they don't have any supervisor training. And they don't know how to deal with some of these situations. It's really important they get the appropriate training so they can, you know, react appropriately to a situation like that. Absolutely. Um, the other thing that's really, that sort of threw me for a loop actually um, recently was there was a, um, an, employee from, uh, an employee from another country, um, from Switzerland or one of those, I think it was Switzerland, um, who was working with a group of folks at a public works department um, and he filed a complaint that um, they were at lunch break and they were all sort of talking and that one of the employees said to this um, person from the other country, why don't you go, you know, you sound like a sheep, why don't you go back to your home country? So my immediate reaction was, oh, they're, gonna, they're in so much trouble. But I, did, I investigated it. And what happened was, the real truth was, this person was berating the United States to the extent that it was, a, a, one of the gentlemen was a, a, was a veteran, and this other person was saying how um, America is terrible, and you know, it was just going on and on and on, and berating all kinds of things, and it wasn't just that day, it was, and he wouldn't stop. And I asked the people involved, what did you do about it? And they said, we tried to de-escalate it. They did exactly what they should have done. They really tried to de-escalate it, and then the guy just got frustrated and he got up and walked off and he quit. So when I did the investigation, I tried to reach out to him to get a statement and he didn't call me back. So, you know, so I used the information that I had to make the determination that that was not uh, what happened. So that, those are kind of how those things happen, but we're gonna, you know, again, my first question to, the first question to me was, you can't discipline somebody from a, you know, fr from another country or from another, you know, that's coming in. And it's not about where somebody's from, it's about anybody's behavior. 
And it was, it would have been, had he stayed, I would have educated him about sort of like, I know this is how you feel and, you know, uh, and those are your opinions, but this is how it affected other people in the workplace and this is how we should um, continue on to have a productive, respectful work environment. That's what I would have done if he had agreed to speak with me. So, um, it's not always cut and dry. Um, anything else? You said you'd tell us a little bit about what an investigation was, and I think you just did. Could you tell us a little bit how something like that starts and what happens in that? Yeah, so I typically will get a call. Um, you know, somebody will have gone to an HR in their town, uh, or if no HR, you know, the town manager or whatever, and, and said, you know, um, I'm filing a complaint for um, harassment. Now, it depends upon the town. Some HR directors will kind of take the, you know, the initial information, the intake, um, and then they typically will call me, and then what I would do um, is I would first call the person that filed the complaint, take their statement, um, and then I would um, call the person that um, they accused, uh, take their statement, and then any other witnesses. Um, and then uh, oftentimes, I don't have enough information to make a determination. And so I may have to expand my investigation. That's why when I said it can't always be 100% confidential because I may have to go outside of that realm and, and talk to some other folks. Um, <clears throat> and then I, you know, me or anyone who does these investigation does have to use a, you know, it's a, it's a judgment based upon information and about, and about sort of whether somebody's credible or not. Um, and then, at, you know, Typically what happens is somebody, the person that's been accused, um, may be placed out on paid administrative leave pending the investigation, so there's no, none of that sort of you know, awkwardness or difficulty in the workplace. Sometimes it can just be handled without that happening, and then um, once a determination is made, I just make my, I send my report to the town manager, and then they make a decision on how they're gonna, if they're gonna discipline somebody or not. So that's sort of the nuts and bolts of that. There's nothing else. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.